So today we're looking at some World War I poetry by Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. Let's take a look at the questions. Question one. Why do you think the rear guard begins with a time and place? What effect might this have? What might be different without this line? So let's take a look at this poem. The rear guard. And it begins with this line that tells us uh, it gives us a time and a place. April 1917 on the Hindenburg line. And the footnote tells us that the Hindenburg line is a defensive line in Western France. Uh, last week we talked about trench warfare. So a line is a long connection of trenches uh, and it says here barbed wire, which is a metal wire with spikes on top so that you can't crawl over or crawl through them. Uh, and guns. So this is what the allies would have to try to uh, break through. And as we talked about last week, um, breaking through a defensive line takes many, many lives. So why does this poem have this at the beginning? Let's take a closer look at the poem. The rear guard. A rear guard is uh, the part of the army that you leave behind uh, when you move to prevent the enemy from following too closely. Uh, so in Chinese, I think this would be Ya as part of an army. Um, OK, groping along the tunnel step by step, he winked his prying torch with patching glare from side to side. In British English, a torch is a flashlight. Uh, so this um, main character is walking through an underground tunnel. Uh, usually in in a trench, a tunnel would have light. Uh, but since this is the rear guard, I, most of the army has probably already left and the lights have been turned off, so it's completely dark. He only has his uh, small flashlight and it the light is so weak that the poem calls it winking. Like a, a winking star. Um, and the air is unwholesome. He sees many different things. Uh, this is 50 feet below the battle overhead. So the first stanza is telling us what he sees, what's going on and what he sees. Suddenly he trips. He saw someone lying at his feet. He asks this uh, sleeping soldier, I'm looking for headquarters, Zongbu. When he gets no reply, he curses the soldier. Um, the speaker, for days he'd had no sleep. Uh, probably because he's trying to find his army, right? I'm looking for headquarters. Uh, you know, usually in war, soldiers have to move fast. And if you're the rear guard, that means you have to move extra fast to catch up with your your own unit, your own army. So our main character gets annoyed, curses this sleeping soldier, kicks him, but then he realizes that this guy is dead. Uh, he flashed his beam of light across the face, terribly glaring up whose eyes yet wore agony, dying hard ten days before. 
So this guy is not only dead, he died a, a terrible death 10 days before, and his eyes are still open. And uh, the guy on the ground, fists of fingers clutched a blackening wound. So he died of a kind of wound. So the only person our main character meets is a dead person. So he continues. He keeps going until he finds Dawn's ghost that filtered down a shafted stair. So finally he sees an exit to the tunnel, a stairs going up. So a shaft is an opening to the surface. Usually we say a mine shaft. Uh, and the light the poem calls Dawn's Ghost. But where do these stairs go? They go to the dazed, muttering creatures underground who hear the boom of shells and muffled sound. So even though they open up to light, the, the, the opening is still underground, probably in a trench. Uh, and the trench is filled with dazed, muttering creatures or, you know, soldiers. Uh, and these soldiers keep hearing the boom of shells or bombs in muffled sound. So not directly near them because they're still underground. At last, with sweat of horror in his hair, he climbed through darkness to the twilight air, unloading hell behind him step by step. So this last line is calling uh, the tunnel a kind of hell. But notice that when he leaves this hell, the place that he ends up at is also a kind of hell. Right, it's full of dazed and muttering creatures. Um, and the light is Dawn's ghost. It's full of the boom of shells. So, you know, he, he says he's leaving hell, but he also arrives at another kind of hell. So what do we have here? Uh, a uh, sort of journey underground, a dead sentry, uh, a dead guard, and then you have imagery like Dawn's ghost, dazed muttering creatures, and calling this tunnel hell. So actually we see that this poem is full of imagery that it can be quite mythological in some water. Right, uh, the mythical journey, uh, the mythical guard, a dead guy. Uh, and then you have calling this place hell, calling light the ghost of dawn. It's very mythological. Um, so adding this detail at the beginning, a specific place in a specific time, makes this poem more concrete. Without this line, right? That's what the question asks. What might be different without this line? Without this line, uh, it would not be as specific. Uh, a journey underground can happen in many places for many reasons, but by adding this time and place, it gives us a very concrete sense that this is a specific part of World War One. That even with all of these mythological uh, images, we still retain the sense that it is about a specific person's specific experiences. And so even though the poem can sometimes get a bit abstract and mythological, the reader always remembers that this supposedly happened to someone. It's not just the poet telling a story. By adding the time and place, the poem is telling us this 
actually happen to somebody. And that specificity, that detail makes the poem more powerful. OK, question two. The general views death as a weapon wielded by officers against infantry. Why do you think this might be important? OK, let's take a look at the general. Good morning, good morning, the general said. So he's a very cheerful guy. When we met him last week on our way to the line, so uh, on our way to the front line of battle. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead. And we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine. So we're calling his staff members uh, incompetent pigs. So there's already an ironic contrast, right? The general is cheerful, but his plans kill most of his soldiers. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack as they slogged up to Eras with rifle and pack. Eras, the, the footnote tells us, is a front line through much of the war in northern France. So here's he's a cheery old card. Card just means a, a guy, a dude. Last line, but he did for them both by his plan of attack. To do for someone means to uh, to set someone up, to hurt someone, to trap someone. Shen hai ren jia. So we have in this poem an opposition between officers and soldiers. Uh, the general uh, is cursed by the soldiers. And in return, the soldiers are killed by the general's plan of attack. So the poem makes as if the soldiers and the general were opposed, like they're fighting each other. So first of all, that tells us how bad the morale was uh, during the war. But secondly, uh, this is also an ironic play on a tradition because in traditional warfare, the officers and the regular soldiers were very different. Usually officers were upper class people, nobles, rich people. Uh, if you remember the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the heroes were all like kings, of small city states were all leaders were all heroes. But the common soldiers are usually just ordinary farmers, working class people, just regular people. And this is true even today. For example, the US Army mostly recruits its soldiers uh, from like uh, high schools in poor places. They like to recruit poor people, black people, working class people. One of the main recruitment tools is a guaranteed um, college education after uh, fighting for a certain number of years. So, uh, you know, college in the US can be quite expensive, but the army says that it will pay all of your college tuition if you fight for them for, I don't know, three years, five years. I can't remember. And so, of course, this has the most appeal to people who really cannot afford college, cannot afford to take a student loan, just really poor working class people. Uh, so even today, the difference between officers and soldiers still exists. So there is a long tradition of officers and soldiers 
uh, distrusting each other, not working well together. Um, but here, this is ironic because here the off the the officers are not actually setting up the soldiers. The officers are not actually really opposed to their soldiers. They're just incompetent. Uh, they get their soldiers killed not for revenge, but simply because they don't know how to use a good strategy. So this poem has two layers of irony. The first is that the general is cheerful, but he gets his soldiers killed. The second is that we expect officers and, and regular soldiers to be against each other, but here they're not really opposed to each other. It just looks like that because the officers are so incompetent. So the question. Uh, how the officers use death as a weapon against their soldiers. It, the idea is important because it's not actually true here. Uh, the fact that it looks like it, it looks like the officers are using death as a weapon against their soldiers just shows us how incompetent they really are. Speaking of irony, if we go back to the rear guard, there is also a sense of irony here. Um, the main character is journeying through hell, but when he reaches daylight, it's just another kind of hell. And that's the first irony. And then there's also an irony between, as I mentioned, all of the mythological imagery and the fact that the poem tells us it happened at a specific time in a specific place. So on the one hand, it happened very specifically, but on the other hand, it's it's like a myth. And that's also ironic. Because remember, irony is just the difference between what it looks like and what it actually is. It doesn't have to be sarcastic. Moving on, question. Three. Before we move on, do you have questions? Do you want to ask me something? Uh, sorry, teacher. Hey, teacher. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you explain the second irony of the, the general again? Sure. Mm -hmm. So the general, it makes it look like the officers and soldiers are against each other. Uh, right here, the soldiers it, or here the soldiers are calling the general and his staff pigs. And the last line says that the soldier took revenge by killing him or killing the soldiers using his strategy. And this is a very traditional way of looking at uh, war when the officers and the soldiers come from very different classes and different backgrounds. But here it's not true. The the officers don't really want their soldiers to die. It only looks like that because their battle plans are so terrible. Um, it's only it only looks like that because they are so incompetent. So on the surface, it looks like the officers and soldiers are against each other. But the truth is even more terrible. It's simply that the officers don't know how to do their job well. So that's the second irony. Um, OK, so it means uh, the soldier may be uh, was the same class with the general or? No, there are probably still different classes. In the First World War, this difference uh, still existed. Um, but at the time, the soldiers, the regular soldiers were probably middle class, not okay. working class. Mm. Um, the irony is that you expect that they are against each other, that they hate each other. Uh, but the truth is it only looks like that because the officers are terrible at their job. 
right? Their battle plans don't really work, and so the plans kill many soldiers. But they don't want their soldiers to die on purpose. It's exactly. simply because they're terrible. Yes. So the irony is that this truth, there's, they're not really opposed to their own soldiers. They just don't know how to do their job well. This truth is even worse than if they were opposed to each other. Like if a, if the general is is competent, if he knows how to do his job, then as as long as you can find some way for the officers and the soldiers to work together, you can fight a good war. But if the general does not know how to do his job, even when the officers and soldiers work together, it's still going to be a long war. So that's why the irony is more terrible. Uh, the truth is more terrible than the surface, even yeah. though the surface already looks terrible. Mm. Okay. That's the irony. OK, thank you. Sure. Other questions? OK, let's move on to question three. Why do you think glory of women ends by addressing a German mother? OK, so we know that a poem has a speaker and an addressee. So the speaker is the person who's talking in the poem. Uh, usually I or we. And the addressee is the person that the speaker is talking to. Uh, so in Glory of Women, you love us when we're heroes. Immediately we have a speaker. And an addressee, right? We and you. You love us when we're heroes home on leave or wounded in a mentionable place. Uh, so the speaker is a kind of soldier. It's probably a soldier. And um, if we look further. Well, we don't look further. If you look at the title, the addressee is probably uh, some women at home and it. Um, probably like um, mothers, wives, that kind of thing. Or that kind of person. And so if the soldier is wounded in somewhere that you you can't talk about in polite society, like if they were wounded in the groin, shushibu, you can't really talk about that um, at a dinner party. Right, it's not s somewhere that's polite to talk about, so uh, we're heroes if we're wounded in a mentionable place. You worship decorations or medals and awards. You believe that chivalry, Chi Si Jingsen, redeems the war's disgrace. So yes, it's a terrible war. We're fighting terribly, but at least there's chivalry. Uh, well, of course, there is no chivalry in mechanized warfare. That's only in traditional warfare. You make us shells. You remember shells are the bombs fired by artillery. Uh, why do women make shells? Because most of the men have joined the fighting, so women had to take up some of the factory jobs. You listen with delight by tales of dirt and danger fondly thrilled. So when we tell you war stories, you listen in delight. You listen at these adventures. You crown our distant ardors while we fight. Ardor means passion. Crown here means glorify. Uh, deem worthy. Describe as valuable. Uh, so you praise our passion when we fight and mourn our laureled memories when we're killed. Uh, laurel is Gui Guan, so it's used to honor uh, heroes. Traditionally. Uh, not sure if it was used during the First World War. No, yeah, in ancient Greece and Rome, victorious generals were crowned with laurel wreaths. Hua uh, Guan. So it's, it's another kind of honor. You honor us when we fight. You honor us when we die. You can't believe that British troops retire when hell's last horror breaks them. 
OK, so first of all, uh, we discovered that we're talking about the speaker is a British soldier, so he's talking about British women. The word retire. Is put in quotation marks. Now in English, there's usually only two reasons to put a word in quotation marks. The first reason is because you are using this. Someone said this word and you are using it exactly as the person said it or you know, like a sentence. You're quoting exactly what the person said. No change at all. The second reason is because this word is being used in a special way. It could be a technical term. It could be ironic, mm -hmm. um, but the, the quotation marks could be telling us not to think of this word in the usual sense. So here the quotation marks are actually doing both. Uh, first is oh, retire here really just means retreat to twi. So first of all, it's a special term used by the newspapers or the army to describe retreating soldiers uh, because they don't they want to avoid using the word retreat. Retreat sounds bad. Uh, so it's a technical term. It's also ironic because again, the difference between the surface and the truth. The surface retire means to take a rest. The truth, of course, is they run for their lives. It's not really a rest. Uh, and the the women of the poem probably see this term in the newspaper. Uh, that's where they get this word from. So it's also a quotation from somewhere else. The newspaper used this exact word. So you can't believe that British troops retire or retreat when hell's last horror breaks them and they run. They finally, their morale has finally been broken. And they run, trampling the terrible corpses blind with blood. So they're running for their lives and it's it's because they're running for their lives. They don't care what they step on. It could be dirt, it could be mud, it could be another soldier, right? The body of another soldier trampling their terrible corpses because they are the, the retreating soldiers are blind with blood. Um, this is also a, a small irony. Usually when we say blind with blood, we mean that they are blind with rage that they want to attack. But here blind with blood means they see blood on themselves, they see blood on their fellow soldiers, and they run for their lives. So it's the opposite of what it usually means. Um, so up to now we have uh, one sense of irony, which is the women think that war is uh, honorable, chivalrous, um, worth praising worth uh, giving glory for and they can't believe that their soldiers would retreat because traditionally retreat was seen as dishonorable uh, you've probably heard we'll fight to the last man which means no running away uh i don't know that's never been like a a good strategy to never run, I think, even in traditional warfare. Sometimes you just got to run, but it's seen as cowardly. It's seen as dishonorable. Uh, whereas the truth is war in the mechanized war is hell. And they're so scared that they step on dead soldiers. So that's the first irony. What women think the war is like versus what the war is actually like. Let's get into the last three lines. Oh, German mothers dreaming by the fire. So suddenly we have switched from British women to German women. Uh, remember First World War, the two were, were enemies, right? The British were fighting the Germans. Uh, the British and their allies were fighting the Germans and their allies. 
Uh, so this line turning to a German mother. While you are knitting socks to send your son, his face is trodden deeper in the mud. Um, so we see that the German mother is doing the same thing as the British mother. They're supporting their soldiers from home. Right, the British mother makes shells. The German mother makes socks. And the fate of the soldiers are also the same. The British soldiers are being stepped on during retreat. The German soldiers are also being stepped on so that his face is trodden, pressed ever deeper into the mud. Remember, uh, at that time, war between two countries when it was not just about fighting, it was also about the atmosphere at home. Newspapers would often call the enemy evil, barbarians, unchristian, um, that it would be right and good for the world for them to be defeated. Um, so this poem is telling us that this is not true. The enemy is just the same as you are. Their mothers are supporting their soldiers. Their soldiers are dying and being stepped on. There's no difference. So that's what the turning to the German mother is doing. First layer of irony, uh, the poem gives us the difference between what German, uh, sorry, what British women think and what British soldiers experience. But the second layer of irony is the difference between what British people think and what German uh, think happen, uh, what British people think about the enemy and what the enemy is actually like, which is basically the same as us. There's no real difference between us and the enemy. So that's what turning to the German mother does at the end. It connects across enemy lines. It shows us that uh, we, by we I mean the we of the poem, we British, are not special. This tragedy is happening to everyone. And so um, the, the title also has two layers of irony. First, like when you say the glory of women, it could mean two things. It could mean uh, what women think of as glory, what they consider to be glory, or it could mean the glory won by women, what women do to earn glory. Uh, so the first meaning we talked about, right? They think that war is honorable and glorious. It's not here. It's not. The second meaning could be referring to um, how women bring glory for themselves by joining the war effort from home, right? Making shells, supporting the soldiers, celebrating the soldiers could also bring them a kind of glory because this is what women at home were expected to do. This is how they joined the war. Uh, but it, it's all false. It doesn't really mean anything when soldiers keep dying in millions and millions. Uh, so both senses of the title are ironic. There's an irony between what the women think and what is actually happening. And there's an irony between what people think of the enemy and what the enemy are actually like. Uh, and that's what turning to a German mother does for the poem. OK, so uh, those are the three poems by Siegfried Sassoon. Do you have questions? OK, let's go on to poem four, Futility. This is the first poem we're reading by Wilfred Owen. Do you think futility subverts traditional Christian ideas? If so, how? So subvert means uh, distort, twist, uh, change up. So 
um, supposedly there will be some kind of Christian traditional Christian ideas and the poem may use these ideas differently. Let's take a look. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once at home, whispering of fields half sown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. OK, so we see that a soldier has died. Line five, until the word until. Most of you use this word incorrectly. Until now means it it uh, or until this morning means before this morning something was happening and this morning it stopped. Often when Taiwanese students use until they mean that even this morning it is still happening, but until means a change. So uh, I was hungry until this morning means this morning I stopped being hungry. Uh, if you want to say that this morning you're still hungry, you would have to say, I have been hungry since, uh, and then you give like a starting time. Or, uh, you know, you would turn it around and describe how you stopped being hungry this morning. Until means something changes. Or, uh, why would you need to say that you're hungry before you're hungry this morning and you're still hungry? Yeah, you just say I have. OK. Um, yeah, you would just say I have been hungry since and then give uh, the time you started being hungry. Until means change. So here the sun always used to wake him, but not this morning. Um, so it used to wake him at home, whispering of fields half sown. To sow a field means to to scatter seeds, to plant seeds. Bozong. So the sun used to remind him of uh, fields that he has to farm. So it reminds him of things he has to do. It reminds him of the the work of life. Always it woke him, even in France. So even after the war began, when they were fighting in France, the sun would still wake him each morning. So it's not directly tied to the work of farming. Until this morning in this snow, but this morning in the snow, he's not waking up. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old sun will know. So here we have a sense of hopelessness, of desperation. It's like we've tried everything to wake him up. Nothing works. The last resort we could try is to get the sun to wake him. After all, the sun has woken him every day of his life. If the sun can't wake him, nothing will. But of course, you know, he's dead. The sun is not going to wake him. So it's a hopeless hope. It's desperation. Wong. Think how it wakes the seeds, the sun. Think how the sun wakes the seeds. It woke once the clays of a cold star. So here it's talking about how the sun helped create life. The cold star is Earth. I know it's not a star, but you know, this is a poem. It's fine. And clay is referring to the lifeless part of Earth. So it's saying once that the, the, the sun once turned inanimate clay into life. But of course, you know, in the Christian tradition, this is God. God made Adam out of the earth. He turned clay into life. But here the poem isn't talking about God. It's talking about the sun. Uh, and, you know, biology Biologically speaking, it's true. The sun gave energy to to for life to appear on Earth. That's true. Um, our limbs so dear achieved. 
Our sides full nerves still warm too hard to stir. So stir means to waken to wake up. So it's saying are these limbs, these arms and legs, which took a deer means costly, which took so long and so much energy to grow. Are these sides of the body full, which are full of nerves? Um, nerves are. Sanjing. Full of complex nerves and they're still warm, so the guy recently died. Are these things too hard to awaken? Right, we this it took so long for these uh, limbs to grow. They are so complex and still warm. How could they be so hard to awaken? Was it for this that the clay grew tall? So remember the sun turned clay into uh, life and helped the clay grow tall. Did the sun work so hard to help this man grow tall simply to kill him in this war? Simply for him to die meaninglessly in this war? Was it for this the clay grew tall? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth's sleep at all? Fatuous mean here means wasteful, useless. If this is the purpose for this man to grow, then why did the sun work so hard to 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 create life in the first place? Uh, if life, if the purpose of this life is to die meaninglessly, then then the sun might as well not have created this life in the first place. It's a meaningless life. This is also not a very Christian idea. Remember in uh, Paradise Lost when Adam and Eve were arguing whether to work together or to work separately. Eve said, oh, if we split up, we can do more of the work. And Adam replies, God did not put us here to work. He put us here to enjoy life, to enjoy each other. It doesn't matter if we do a little work or a lot of work. That's not the point. But here, uh, the poem is defining the, the value of a life as what it does at the end, how it dies, what it achieves. Whereas the traditional Christian idea is that life itself is valuable. So does the poem subvert traditional Christian ideas? It does in two places. One, uh, the creator of life, the poem calls the sun. It avoids talking about God. And secondly, uh, it talks about the meaning of a life as what it can achieve and what it does and how it dies, rather than the fact that it exists and can enjoy life. Um, but the fact that the poem does not mention God is itself a part of what makes it a World War I poem. When the truth of this war was revealed to the public, when the public realized how terribly the, the, the strategies were, how many people were dying, they started to distrust the government. And it also dis the public also started distrusting the media because the media were trying to sell the war to the public. Finally, they also started to distrust the re religion, mostly Christianity, because um, bishops and priests and pastors were also encouraging people to fight the war. This also has a long tradition of uh, soldiers being blessed by God, like we will win the war because God wants us to win the war, these kinds of things. But when the so many millions of men started dying, people also started mis distrusting this religion. So the fact that this poem is basically using religious imagery, but not mentioning religion, is also what makes it a First World War poem. Uh, okay, 
let's take a short break. Do you want to ask me questions during the break? Do you have questions? No questions? OK, let's take a short break. Question five. How do you think the poems of Sassoon and Owen differ? Uh, so we've seen the three Sassoon poems and they're highly focused on irony. Um, what about Owen? We've read one Owen poem. Let's read the other one. Dolce et decorum est. Um, and and this means from the last line of the home, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori means it is sweet and meet to die for one's country. Sweet, of course, means good, and meet means proper, justified. So it is good and proper to die for your country. That's what this means. Uh, okay, let's take a look at this poem. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, which means um, their legs are shaking and their knees are knocking against each other. Coughing like hags, we curse through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. So the army is moving, they're trudging through sludge, which is like mud. They're bent double because they're carrying things like old beggars under sacks. They're weak and knock kneed. They're coughing. And it's in the middle of the night because a flare is uh, a light fired into the sky. Um, so it's currently in the middle of the night. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. To to be shod means to wear as a shoe. So bloodshod means they wear their blood like a shoe. Their their feet are very bloody because they lost their boots. All went lame. They can't walk very well. All blind because it's in the middle of the night. Drunk with fatigue. They're so tired that it seems like they're drunk. Deaf, even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. So five nines are bombs dropping from the sky. So they're so tired that they don't even hear the sound of bombs dropping behind them. We know it's behind because they outstripped the five nines. Outstrip means to to go farther than to go faster than. Uh, drop behind. So this first stanza is giving us the imagery of exhaustion, fatigue. Uh, wound, being wounded, being tired. And that's just the beginning of the poem. Second stanza. Gas, gas, quick boys. Did you notice that the second gas is all capital letters, all uppercase letters? This tells us that the second sound is louder, so it's the the person yelling is uh, yelling louder and louder. Gas, gas, quick boys. And gas, of course, here means poison gas. Uh, the First World War is famous for its use of poison gas warfare. Um, it was not much used afterwards because it was so hard to control. You can't control the wind. Um, but as with many things, the First World War is the first time uh, many new wartime technologies were used, including gas warfare. So OK, so when the gas comes, what do you need to do? An ecstasy of fumbling, 
fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. You have to put on your gas mask. Uh, and at the time, the gas mask was an entire helmet and mask. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering, which means like twisting around on the ground like a man in fire or lime. Lime is used to burn bodies. Uh, I think in Chinese it's something like that. So it's like he's burning. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light. Uh, OK, misty panes. A pane of glass is a sheet of glass, a surface of glass. So a misty pane is here talking about the gas mask through the gas mask. And through the thick green light, this could be the green of the gas. Uh, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. So everything looks green. It looks like under sea. And so the guy looks like he's drowning. So he looks like he's burning and he looks like he's drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. Gutter here is is the sound of choking, the sound someone makes when they can't breathe. So in this stanza, it's suddenly moving from the uh, past to the present. The speaker is saying, even today, I cannot forget when I, when I saw this image. Uh, the image of someone dying from poison gas. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. So the guy doesn't die immediately. He dies a slow and painful death. He can't walk, so they fling him. They toss him into a wagon. And his white eyes are writhing, looking around wildly. Um, his face is like a devil's. Uh, ugly and grotesque because of pain. If you could hear at every jolt, so every time the wagon hits a bump in the road, the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs. Uh, so his lungs are being corrupted. Blood is coming out in in bubbles from his mouth. Uh, froth is like the bubbles, like when you drink um, soda, the bubbles on top. That's froth. Obscene as cancer, bitter as the cut of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. If you could see all this, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest. Zest means enthusiasm. To children, ardent, ardent means passionate. For some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. So it's saying that if you had seen what war is actually like, if you had seen what it is like for a fellow soldier to die a slow and painful death from poison gas. You would never think to say that it is good and just and right to die for your country. Because nothing could justify dying like this. So here we do have a small irony, right? People think it's good and, and proper to die for your country, but the truth is it's not. But the the stronger sense from this poem is a sense of hopelessness. Someone is poisoned. The speaker even today cannot forget uh, the helpless sight. How helpless this dying soldier was. And it took eight lines to describe his death. It's a slow and painful death. And the other soldiers can only look on as this soldier dies slowly and painfully. They can't do anything to help him. 
So the entire poem, even from the first stanza, right? This is a very hopeless and desperate situation. Some people have lost their boots. Uh, they are marching through the night. They don't pay attention to anything. Uh, they are extremely tired. You would only march through the night like this if you had to. So it's also a very hopeless and desperate situation. So if we combine this poem with futility, which is also full of hopelessness, right? The sun can't wake him. Even the sun can't wake him. What use is, is his 18 years of life is if he dies just like this. So it's full of uh, hopelessness and meaninglessness. Uh, I think this is what we can say about Owen's poems. So Sassoon's poems are more focused on the direct irony, the powerful irony, because remember he was writing so that the people at home could truly understand what the war is like. So he wanted to create st a strong ironic emotion to make to shock people into seeing what the war is really like. Um, so in the rear guard, you have the shocking irony between uh, the ordinary soldier's regular journey. This is not a special journey. It's something that uh, rear guard soldiers have to do all the time. And but the irony is to compare that ordinary journey with a mythological journey through hell. That's how terrible this ordinary journey is. In Glory of Women, you have the irony of what women think about the war versus what the war is actually like. And also the irony between what people think about the enemy. And the fact that the enemy is just the same as us. Uh, in the general, you have the irony between um, the officers versus the soldiers, but also you have the irony between an intention, what looks like an intentional opposition between officers and soldiers, and what is in fact simply the result of officer incompetence. So Sassoon's poems are all highly focused on strong irony, but Owen's poems are less focused on irony. There is still irony, but it's less less focused on irony and more focused on uh, a sense of hopelessness and meaninglessness. Right? Futility is called futility. It's useless. It won't work. No matter how hard you try, how hard you hope, it's not going to awaken this dead soldier. The sun is not going to help awaken this dead soldier. And in Dolce et Decorum Est, uh, the, the main sense is a sense of hopelessness at watching your fellow soldier die from poison gas and not being able to do anything for him. Even many years after, the speaker still cannot forget how helpless the situation was, how hopeless the situation was. So that's how the poems of these two poets that we have read today differ. OK, those are the five questions. Do you want to ask me something? About these five poems? Questions? Teacher, I want to ask. Yeah, uh, I want to ask the first point, the rear guard, right? Yes, in the first stanza, uh, the last line, the rosing gloom of battle overhead. <laughs> I want to know why it's, uh, rose, this rosing uh, is, is an atmosphere of the war or it just to uh, what is described? OK, so yes, uh, good question. The word rosy usually means good, but here, because the poem is using myth, this is calling back to the Iliad. Uh, in the Iliad, the dawn is called rosy fingered dawn. It's uh, describing the color of the sunrise. Um, yeah, and at, at the bottom of the poem, it says uh, it's twilight. 
twilight could be before sunrise or after sunset. But rosy gloom tells us that this is before sunrise. OK. Oh, it's, uh, it's just to present a time, a time, a timing. Right, and also to connect it to the ancient Greek uh, stories oh. of the Trojan War. Okay. Uh, because in the Iliad, the dawn is called rosy fingered dawn. Rosy fingered dawn. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? No questions? Okay, let's talk about the final exam. Um, 